Hello, friends. Welcome to Opera Unbound, a podcast that helps break down stereotypical barriers people have with opera and also introduce it to new audiences in a fun and engaging way. You can learn more about our podcast at www.patreon.com slash opera unbound. In today's episode, we talk about making opera relevant, whether companies should do that through modern productions, simply doing modern opera, English translations, and all the other various pieces that are involved in making opera relevant for today's society. We hope you enjoy. are here today to talk about making opera relevant. It's a common conversation heard in the opera industry, and many people believe that opera is an art form stuck in the past. Opera companies around the world experiment with different strategies for making opera relevant. Why? The bottom line is to fill seats. So we're going to discuss different ways that companies have experimented with making opera relevant. So first, we're going to cover modern productions. And this, of course, means that it can't be a new opera. It has to be an opera from the past that's been performed many times. So first, let's start with uh, the Seattle Opera's 2015 production of The Flying Dutchman. Um, this was a really interesting production because it was on a slanted stage the entire time. A rake, basically, the whole entire thing was raked, no levels in terms of steps or whatever. It's just completely raked, all one, um, one backdrop essentially, and uh, and then they, of course, for the different scenes, they had lighting and and all that stuff. Um, both Rachel and I were in it, and uh, I thought it was really well received um, uh, and very interesting in terms of not only how the director was looking at it, but also us trying to be on this rake stage and act like we're being tossed in the wind and all that on the ship and and things like that. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, I just thought I'd mention that we were set in, in a... Uh... Uh, was it 1920s or 1930s? I think it was... We'll say late 20s, early 30s was like the whole overarching um, time setting of the piece. And um, it the whole thing, you know, if you think about German expressionism, how it, a German expressionist painting looks, is that's how the production looked and felt. Um, very much playing on this... Um, high emotions, you know, everything's put to extreme contrast. Yeah. One thing that's also interesting, and this isn't um, new to modern productions, but they have a twist ending, you know, in the original, Zenta, of course, throws herself off a cliff because she can't have the Dutchman. Um, but in this production, we actually have Eric shooting her and killing her at the end um right I remember which that. that i would say is one of the things that if in the reviews that the the reviewers and honestly many of the diehard wagner fans usually if they had an issue with the show that was it so there are risks you take with doing a modern production you know, because you will have those people who are set in their ways and they want to see the same thing that they've seen 50 million times. So when you throw a curve right. in there, like a gun versus a, a jump, um, that can be a little bit jarring to some. But others, you know, they're like, oh, this is more real. It also makes more sense with the time period that we were going for um, and things like that. And I, I think people probably feel similarly to uh, the 2016 Carmen 
production at San Francisco Opera, which um, was set in like the 50s and had that like rockabilly bad boy thing going on. And um, I heard, I, you know, I didn't see the production, but I heard um, people either really loved it or they they still wanted that very traditional um, Spanish influence setting of Carmen. Um, while we're talking about modern productions, I did, um, you know, I was kind of just Googling about modern productions of opera and like seeing what pops up. And I have to say, um, there are some angry people on Facebook because there was a group or a page, um, people against modern opera or modern opera productions or bad, something like that. I don't know, but it was like 61,000 likes. Holy cow. Page. So but, there are definitely a, a community of opera followers who are very against modern productions. Yeah. But wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me there's a group of really mad people on Facebook? I mean, <laughs> who could have saw this coming? I, I've never heard of these right. things. Um, right. It's... Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not surprised by that. You know, everybody's, you know, got their opinions and, and all that stuff. I... I don't know. We'll get more into, I'm sure, our various views personally about modernizing um, opera and, and how to make it more relevant because we both feel, because we're in the industry, that it's a powerful thing uh, and it, it can be more than just entertainment. Um, but yeah, there's always going to be haters. And if we've learned anything from Taylor Swift, you know, we just got to shake it off and um, just keep going. <laughs> so... Yeah, I think for me, it's all about the context of the opera, what's happening within the opera, and the content, both of those. I think operas, uh, certain operas lend themselves really well to modernizing, um, and particularly for me, it's anytime there's not a specific historical figure involved. I think it's really hard to modernize something like Henry the Eighth, mm. right? If you have an opera with with some sort of royalty involved from a particular time period, most of the things that they're dealing with um, are born out of whatever was happening in the society at that time. And that's not to say that there aren't similar situations in modern settings, but some things don't translate. Mm. Exactly, and especially if we're looking at how the industry feels and has been going when you talk about the purity of certain characters like for example Aida and um, Porgy and Bess and that whole show even Carmen and all that you get into really dicey territory if you're not only modernizing it but then you're casting people who aren't at least look like they are somewhat of that person's race or whatever. So it's, it's a mm -hmm. landmine in, in many ways, um, in a lot of different areas. Yeah. I, where the opera world is, is doing a better job of not whitewashing everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is important. Yep. Um, another, another community that I, that I found online, I went on to, um, Reddit. Of course. Mm -hmm. Of course. I get lost on Reddit a lot of the times. Um, but there was uh, someone who started a thread, what are your thoughts on modern opera productions? And uh, there were only about 30 to 35 comments. Um, and some of those comments weren't exactly relevant. You know, they're just commenting on what the person said. But um, I tallied it up on what people thought and most of the people, the majority of the people were in the middle about this. They felt that, yes, there were productions, modern productions that were good, and then there were modern productions that either they just didn't like or they felt that a traditional period setting would have been better. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, there were only uh, the, the the fours, the absolute, like, yeah, I love... Uh, I love modern productions like one of the users, the Panic Hand, said, love them. Stuffy old productions are boring. <laughs> Perfect. Which is, you know what? <laughs> yeah, like, 
that's that's fine. That's their opinion. And uh, there were only five individuals who were absolutely always for modern productions. And then um, the against outnumbered the four, but didn't outnumber the people who could go either way. So mm. I think that, you know, this is a very small sample size, but I think companies can take away from this that, yes, they can modernize. Um, and, and one of the commenters said, as long as the director doesn't try and overshadow the music, you know, like if a director thinks makes decisions and does things to modernize the production and basically use gimmicks because they feel the the music's too boring and people will get bored, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Then that's not doing the the greatest service to the piece that is on the stage. I think the next thing to cover is something that I know you're a huge proponent of, uh, Mike, mm-hmm. and that's English translations. Yes, English translations, I think, are extremely important in at least the U.S. uh, because English is the official language. And what's really weird is when opera first came to America, they were starting to do them in English anyway. And then for whatever reason, the first opera house that was started banning them was in the 1700s, you know, 1770s through 1860s. And so it just doesn't really make sense. Like if you want to create a new generation of opera patrons, especially younger folks, um, it doesn't make any sense to always do the original language. Now, of course, you can't have a shitty translation. Like, that, of course, is kind of a duh statement. But if you want to bring people in, you can't expect them to pay what many people feel is a lot of money, even though we can have the argument of, okay, so you you feel that $50 for opera tickets is too much, yet you'll pay $800 for Beyonce tickets. But I digress. Um, yeah, well, well, that'll be its its own episode. We'll discuss that. Yeah, yeah. Um, But we have to basically take out all of the barriers. And honestly, the biggest barriers for me, the three biggest, are price, length of the opera, and the fact that it's not in a language that they can understand. So if we at least take care of the language um, problem, I think that we'll be able to really connect with people and bring them in. And then when they... Especially if it's a show that maybe, say, for example, Don Giovanni, uh, Rachel and I have both done Don Giovanni, Um, you do it in English, then if they already kind of know and can remember what it was in English, if they go and see the traditional Italian version, then it's not as much of a leap for them. Whereas if you get some guy who just came out of the fields doing hay or whatever, and he wants some culture in his life, and then you put him in in an opera house, it's just going to be usually a huge leap for someone like that. I'm not saying it's impossible, but right. Right. And I actually, I want to go back and touch on two things that you talked about. Cause you know, you talked about how, um, opera, when it first came to America, um, when, when it first came to America, obviously there were people doing performances in languages other than English before it became an established art form. Um, and talking about the banning, um, in this in the 1700s, they banned opera because they felt that it was um, morally impure, that there were too many um, implications of, um, you know, sex and all these things, you know, that... Prudes. The beginning of America was was pretty conservative, so mm-hmm. there there were many reasons that they felt that it wasn't the best thing for the um, colonies because it really started before even before uh, America became a country. Oh, okay, um, for its citizens to enjoy as entertainment, and yeah, by the time um, opera became established in every major city by the end of the civil war pretty much every city had an opera house um just like it had 
you know, a church or a town hall. And, um, by that time, all, um, opera productions were being done in English. And this is the same thing that, that was happening in Europe. If you were traveling to different countries in Europe at this time, they were going to be doing the productions in their languages. And this still happens in, in Germany. Pretty much uh, everything that you see in Germany in a German house will be in German. And it part of it is mandated by this the state, by the uh, the German government, that um, a certain percentage of the performances have to be in German for exactly the reason you're talking mm-hmm. about, for the accessibility of the patrons. Yeah. And um, there are, I can only think of one major company in the United States that does all of their productions in English, and that is Opera Theater St. Louis. Yeah, that, as far as I know, that's the case, too. You also have English National Opera. They do everything in English. Um, there are smaller companies. A lot of smaller companies choose to do English translations. And uh, at Seattle, and we did uh, Beatrix and Benedict, which is uh, based on... Uh, the Shakespeare play and they actually added some of the Shakespeare text into it to make it flow a little bit better in English. And I actually thought that that worked extremely well. Um, I think there's a place for both personally. I, I definitely believe that there should be a certain percentage of, um, either of the entire season should be in English or that, um, you have at least one or two performances in English of the same opera. Now, that becomes an issue of logistics. Do you, you know, do you have to have an entirely separate cast of main stagers who are just singing in English, which if you have a young artist program, that makes it really easy. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But I I think, I think it is important for things to be sung in in their original language too, for for the um, curation of, that production itself and um you know we live in a day and age of um, subtitled movies and shows i watch a ton of foreign stuff all the time so uh i'm not bothered by reading subtitles and this is you know something that i did even before i became an opera singer or an opera fan well, you know, it's so interesting to me, you know, in talking about do you have different casts or whatever. It's always, <clears throat> as I sound like a 14-year-old boy and my voice is cracking because um, <laughs> I'm just getting over being sick. Uh, it's always interesting to me that companies will have the sur titles above the stage, okay, and they're doing the the show in whatever language it's in. Why don't they just give that exact same translation to the singers? Because what ends up happening is, as a singer, it gets a little bit weird, especially in comedic settings, I think is more where the issue is, where they've put in Mm -hmm. this really clever joke in the surtitle and say you're singing for 10 seconds or whatever, and the joke is... Mm -hmm. Like they're reading ahead and they get to the joke at five seconds, but the actual joke in the original language isn't until 10 seconds, you know, because it's the punchline. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's definitely an issue as well as like for the singer. Like if you're not aware what the surtitles say, which you, you know, I've, we've both been main stagers in addition to being chorus Mm. and, um, yeah, you usually don't get a copy of the surtitles. Yeah. It, 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 where, w- translations are important and um, the, the word choice is important because, you know, English uh, is incredibly specific and, and not all languages have the same level of specificity that, that English does. And that's mostly due to the fact that English has, um, for better word, stolen a lot of mm. words from other languages. Yeah, yeah. Oh, one thing as you were talking that I wanted to bring up is, uh, you know, we, we, or especially me, uh, I wrangle on, you know, opera companies and the industry, you know, we need more English and blah, 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 blah. But I think one thing that is often left out of the equation, and I'm guilty of this too, is in comparison 
to the amount of Italian and French and German opera that's out there, there honestly isn't a lot. I mean, we we started out the Baroque period, had a fair amount, okay? And then it was like this hiatus that, <laughs> that happened where there weren't any at least major composers having their shows being um, written in English first. And then we get to the you know the 20th century and then we start having more stuff written especially out of america so maybe over time maybe even past our lifetimes you know english will start catching up uh in terms of how much more rep there is to choose from and in terms of modernizing opera it also makes it easier um if you have a modern opera that's done yeah the story may be old uh like there's Antony and Cleopatra, um, but that's a, you know, it was by Turnage, and so. Uh, yeah, well, I, I actually, I think this is the one area, um, the one trend in making opera more relevant that companies, uh, most companies, are starting to get right. They're they're starting to use n at least one or two modern operas in their. Um, in their seasons each year. And honestly, this is important for, for two reasons. One, it's the future of opera, right? We have to move yeah. the art form forward. If there's not anything new being written, it stagnates. Totally. Two, it appeals to the people. I wrote down a couple of, you know, operas that I've ever seen or I, I you know, I've heard a lot of buzz about. I saw Silent Night in um i want to say it was 2014 at forward opera and i absolutely loved it i the music is beautiful the production was extremely well done and uh and thing i liked about this opera is it actually is multilingual because it's about you know it's it, world war one during the the ceasefire on christmas christmas eve and so you've got German soldiers, you've got French soldiers, you have um, Italian soldiers, Scottish, and English, I believe. And all they all sing in the individual languages of their nation. And I just thought it was really beautiful the way it was put together. Um, and I saw the Steve Jobs production when it was here in Seattle. And, um, you know, that's that's so in the now between it being Steve Jobs and it being techie in Seattle. Like, of course that's going to draw people in. People are interested in these billionaire tech people right now are obsessed with what's going on in their lives. They're the new celebrities, honestly. I mean, I couldn't tell you who was in the last major movie cause I don't go to the movies anymore. Um, but I can tell you who, who, you know, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, you know, all these people leading tech businesses. Oh, I was going to say, um, the whole looking at TV and film and producing operas off of that, there have been some really great shows. Um, one show that I absolutely love is Dead Man Walking, which of course is based on a true story. It was done as a movie and, um, Sean Penn, I think was the was De Rocher, who's the guy in the middle of it, who ends up uh, killing these two kids um, in the 60s or 70s, something like that. And it's really well crafted. Another piece that I actually really liked that when I first heard it at, um, at the beginning of the show, I thought I was going to hate it because I really don't like um, some of the late 20th century um music that's written where it's very it's like practically atonal and unbearable um but the the movie that they based it off was off of was broke back mountain and right and uh yeah i've never seen that that movie but um the way that the opera goes it was actually really engaging despite the fact the music made me want to rip my ears off at certain points um it still was engaging enough <laughs> Uh, that I that I got into it, you know, and now they have a Breaking Bad opera that's that's going to be done. 
Um, oh, I that's yeah, they, new. They've talked about it for it's been a couple of years. I think it's just going to be like a one act, <clears throat> a one act. But um, you know, there's lots of things that they're going to be doing. The one thing that I would love to see them do is something like Friends or Seinfeld. I think that would be hilarious as like a some kind of opera. But you know, probably getting the rights to any of that stuff is just buco dollars. Yep. So um, well, I mean, the uh, San Francisco Opera is putting on uh, *Handmaiden's Tale* in this next oh, wow. season. Oh wow! Okay. So that's uh, I think that's going to be extremely well put, uh, attended. You know, obviously since it's uh, what's that? Is that streaming on Hulu? Is that on Hulu? Uh yes, I think it was on Hulu. It wasn't on Netflix. Yeah. Um, and, uh, then, uh, some opera companies do, um, schedule at least one musical theater piece into their, uh, season. And, and, you know, I've seen a mix of whether it's like the, the sort of musical theater that's early enough that it's basically operetta or it's like golden age, uh, musical theater. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we don't want to hear an operatic version of Wicked. I think that would be um, terrible or Frozen. So popular, <laughs> Pop, popular. But yeah, not it's not gonna work. Um, but you know, of course, the the infamous one that's always the blend is Sweeney Todd. You know, is it a musical? Because right. Sondheim wrote it, or is it an opera? You know, I I think that just logistically. Uh, um, According to the score, it is a black operetta. Okay, operetta, perfect. But so I'm I'm pretty firm about that that it's an operetta. Yeah, uh, but I think it's just from a practical perspective, smart of these companies to throw in a musical theater piece if they can. That is maybe you know golden age or early operetta or something, just because um, it will be in English more than likely. Or, yeah, it will be in English. Uh, and lots of people will recognize the names of those shows that aren't necessarily aficionados in opera music. You know, everybody's gone to their local high school version of Greece, or I'm not saying that Greece would be one of them, but you know what I mean? My Fair Lady or... So. Yeah, to, I mean, talking about name recognition, um, that's another strategy that... Uh, opera companies have used as well, either hiring um, directors from TV and film. And uh, there were several productions done um, by Peter Sellers. I saw it was a Marriage of Figaro, uh, a video version of it, mm -hmm. and and Don Giovanni. He did a. There's two uh, productions of those on video that you can find out there in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, you know, uh, hiring famous designers like Zonda Rhodes. So basically, they're just using star power, essentially. Um, yeah, name recognition to get get people uh, who might not be, you know, super sold on the opera by itself, but they're like, oh, but but this person who's a great director is directing it. Let's see what you know what he does with it, or you know, they bring in. Uh, you know, either set or costume designs from famous fashionistas, and uh, try and bring in people that way. Because I mean, mm -hmm. there—I mean, there's the uh, grand element of opera that is expected a lot of the times. Yeah, and well, <clears throat> I think that it it definitely can be a good idea to do that. However, depending on how they do it, it can also misfire, you know, because like I've mentioned with some of the productions we've been in, sometimes when you do a modern production, you're putting a Band-Aid on a, like, huge wound for people, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. you don't want people to go solely for the spectacle because that's not necessarily going to exactly. keep them coming all the time. Right. Well, and, I, and the thing that I think more concerns me is how much of an investment is that in what is the return on it? Totally, yeah. Because those people, because they have huge name recognition, are going to be a more expensive contract. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, in America, opera houses are funded by patrons. You know, I mean, yes, they do get a, a certain amount of grant money, but, you know, it's not that much. They have to fill seats and rely on ticket sales at a much higher percentage than European countries do companies in European countries. Yeah. And the trend, at least over the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years has, you know, cause they used to be mostly subscription based, <clears throat> subscription based, but um, now it, a lot of people are doing single tickets. So it's really hard for companies. And I, I don't, you know, envy them in this regard. They, they can't expect like certain amounts of revenue anymore like they used to because people are, because our economy has changed, just our whole society has changed um, in so many ways. Uh, and especially again, if you're trying to create a new audience, a new audience member isn't just going to buy a whole entire season without seeing it first, or at least one or two be like, oh yeah, this would definitely be something I would see myself spending hundreds of dollars, maybe even thousands of dollars over the span of a year, depending on where their seat is. And and either way, I mean, it's a huge commitment too to to have to, I mean, financially and as far as planning your entire, you know, year if it's that case. Mm. And I, not everybody can do that. No. I would even say that most people can't do that, um, unfortunately. But, you know, that's why you got to rope people in uh, different ways and depend. Honestly, like, I don't know if this is necessarily true, but I'm going to throw it out there. Um, I think that there is a lot that these big companies can do. But I think that there's only so much that they can do in order to bring in um, new patrons solely because they're so massive and they have to kind of play it safe. I think that there needs to be a much bigger emphasis on these local companies and have them maybe take some risks, which at the same time, they don't have as big a revenue stream, so maybe they don't want to take the risk. But if if you can bring them in, bring people in from the small companies because they are cheaper to go to overall, you do innovative productions there not necessarily expensive ones innovation does not equal expensive um right right but if you bring them in that way then they get used to that and then they can look at a bigger you know a level house and be like you know what i saw these really cool productions at these other things maybe it's actually worth paying that extra money to go and see a huge production a traditional production at this a level house that's near me or even a b level house we hope you're enjoying this episode of the podcast today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at 1-800-LE-0-A after being quarantined for weeks all of us are yearning to get out and have a good time if you're like me you can't wait to hang out with your friends and kick back with an aged whiskey or a six pack of white claw instead you've been forced to enjoy those social loops by yourself causing you to feel lonely which always gives way to irrational and questionable behavior don't be like my friend nemarino who after two bottles of brandy went to get more at the local store and was pulled over by the police now his life is turned upside down but you know who he called to help him through it 1-800-LE-0-A they specialize in turning horrendously bad decisions made while drinking into something you can survive. I thought I was royally corkscrewed, but thanks to 1-800-LE-0-A, I can move on with my life and enjoy my months of rehab and community service. Don't drink and drive, but if you do, 1-800-LE-0-A is here to make lemons into shandy. 1-800-LE-0-A I guess we have to talk about the elephant in the room. This is the one part about modernization um that i'm not a fan of and it's trends that have come over from tv and film okay what specifically <laughs> mostly looks over quality oh yeah yeah that's definitely an issue mm -hmm. you know and, and it, it's not just with singers it's just with everything it becomes about flash and gimmick and not about the music which i'm sorry but when you go to an opera the voice is paramount. Without the singers, there's no opera. And uh, it, that's my 
it it's also, my soapbox. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll <laughs> add on to your soapbox because <clears throat> this is something that I, uh, I don't like either. And it's mostly just how our society is, unfortunately. I don't know how much of it we can really move the ball f- in a forward direction just because there's only so much we can do in the opera community. It's not as popular, unfortunately, as TV and uh, movies. But what I want to say is that, like, what I don't understand is you can have singer A and singer B. Okay, singer A, let's say that person could be on the cover of any major magazine. They're gorgeous, regardless of their sex, doesn't matter. They're gorgeous, but... They have, we'll say, in terms of grading, a B-level voice. Mm -hmm. Then you have singer B, who isn't your traditional, what we would see as a traditional leading uh, actor or actress. But Mm -hmm. they have an A-level voice. They can really communicate um, whatever they're singing. Which one do you go with? Um, I would prefer singer B... And and also, it goes to the fact, you know, there's a lot of talk about looks and, like, you need to be skinny, you need to be thin, you need to be ripped if you're a dude. Um, mm-hmm. But are you telling me that there are people who are overweight that can't fall in love ever? Right, exactly. Uh, no, we see, th- we see this literally every day of our lives. There are people who we... Because beauty is subjective. Um. We see people that maybe in our view, we don't understand how that relationship works because we've been told by the society that, you know, if you're a certain level of look, why would you go for somebody that's so quote unquote beneath mm-hmm. you? You know, that's just a stupid thing to, to do when it comes to casting, yep. because as you said, and I agree with you, <clears throat> the voice is paramount. They have to be able to not only get through the role, they have to <laughs> sing the role mm-hmm. well. And communicate whatever it's going to be. And if you actually can connect with people, that will overcome, I would guess, 98% of people. You're always going to have people that are just super shallow. And like, well, they were a good singer, but um, I just didn't think they were hot enough to play that role. Like, okay, whatever, dude. Like, shut up. Go home. Um, because everyone else enjoyed it. And you just are looking at things that in the long run are not as important. I've never seen a production with someone who's not the traditional lead type that didn't convince me that they were capable of falling in love with that person. They sang and communicated um, at an extremely high level and it was believable. And also I've never been distracted by someone's weight on stage. So I, I think that that argument that people's, weight or body type, whatever it is, you know, whether they're too short or too tall, because that's something too. I've talked with singers who um, are told they're too short to be a lead or women that are too tall to be uh, specific romantic roles because they tower over, let's say, the leading tenor. You know, it's why why put why try and put people in these boxes yeah and it's just so stupid like are you telling me that danny devito can't get a woman because he's like 411 <laughs> or whatever he is like really yeah like like it's just it's so stupid and people are at yeah. the end of the he, day he's been happily married for many years if you you all'd like to know yeah it's just people are shallow unfortunately or yeah. or the companies believe that more people are shallow than not, and so they just err on the side of caution. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. Anyways, we've talked about it, um, checked it off the list. Let's talk about uh, another big thing that uh, comes from TV and film, and that's shortening pieces. I've been in several productions where they make large cuts um, or speed up tempos even in order to get it under a certain time limit. Mm-hmm. And there's two reasons, two major reasons, and that's, um, you know, they're worried about the audience attention span, um, because apparently modern audiences can't sit down and watch something for more than three hours, but they can binge an entire season of, you know, something on their 
their Netflix or their Amazon Prime. Um, and the union costs of of doing longer productions and that usually is specifically the, the orchestra unions. They have a little bit stricter um, overtime clauses than senior unions do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not buying the um, audience attention span argument to a certain extent, just because a, we have movies all the time that are three, two and a half, three hours there are also the podcast world in terms of these long form podcasts, you know, two, three hours are pretty common now. I mean, I listen to certain ones that are two hours literally all the time. Um, so I, I'm not necessarily buying that. I definitely understand the um, the whole money argument with the orchestra and the unions. But it, I guess it just depends on the reasoning for the cuts. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, is it solely that is it because there are a lot of sections that are just repeats? Why do we need to waste our vocal energy on stuff that repeats? Um, I'm not saying always cut repeats, but if you're talking about the Bacanto period, the repeats are supposed to be ornamented in a different way. Okay, well, let's say they don't ornament it. Well, then they're falling out of period practice. Yeah. Um, so I guess for me, I, uh, as you know, I love cutting shows. I love butchering shows, uh, (laughs) to death, taking them from three hours to one. But the way I get around that is by rewriting the libretto and connecting dots. Um, so I'm not necessarily against that. It just, you have to have a clear reason that's more than just money and, uh, attention span. Yeah. Okay. So we've covered a whole bunch of different ways of how companies try and make opera relevant. And now we have to talk about, do they need to do this overall? You know, does, does relevance equal relatability? You know, opera is the culmination of many great art forms, visual costumes, poetry, drama, symphonic and vocal music and that's the beauty of an operatic experience it's also the most challenging part of marketing the art form audiences taste very widely and marketing to all these members can be tricky Um, some companies choose to focus on particular repertoire whether it be classic or modern um, and their success is measured by sales and revenues and we'll talk about that more in another segment Um, each of these art firms were in their beginning heavily subsidized by royalty and nobility and each of them broke free of those bonds and even opera as a result of the industrial revolution became an art form that was for the masses and I think that not a lot of people think that way about opera still it's stuck in this idea that it's just for rich people and only supported by rich people. Many companies now copy, we talked about this, they copy trends of film. And I don't think it's all together a terrible idea, but I think it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. Um, TV and film don't rely on a definitive number of performances. Opera by nature is a live event and therefore is limited to a particular number of shows. And that means the companies have to recoup their costs in a short period of time. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, you know, the question of whether we need to keep these things timeless or try to modernize them to make them relevant. It, I agree with the whole idea of a double edged sword or it's very tricky because at least we can say that moving forward, there's more modern opera being done so as are being um, composed. So over time, as companies take those uh, shows on, I think that some of that uh, gap will be bridged in that way. Um, But you know, there are a lot of things in these timeless pieces that are relevant no matter what. And there are also things that are problematic for a lot of people. Right. So uh, I think that how they modernize it is is extremely important if they're going to do it. Um, Because you don't want to pander. 
You don't want to be untrue to the original. Um, or if you're going to just kind of take the rug out from underneath it, have a clear vision of what that is. Um, and you can make that clear to the audience in your program notes or, or whatever. I don't necessarily envy companies and when they try to modernize it, but I also feel that there are some companies that could do a better job of it if they considered certain things. It's all about telling the story and telling it with integrity and keeping the integrity of the music, letting mm -hmm. that be what guides every decision made about the production. I think if, if a company does those things, audiences are going to relate to it. Just look at what's popular with with modern audiences today, you have a mixture of, you know, people love period pieces. People love um, all the new space exploration sci-fi and people love reality TV still. It's still a thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and sitcoms, you know, th those are the things that, that people really find appealing. And um, what it comes down to is the story that's told and how it's told. Um, I think if companies use a good mixture of repertoire, including contemporary operas, they're going to have a better job um, filling the seats. And it's all about selling the experience because that's what makes opera different. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's just really nothing as thrilling, to me at least, and I, I would assume you agree because we both do this. Um but there's nothing as thrilling as because you can hear people sing through microphones and <clears throat> and all that stuff. And it's great. You can go to a concert and it's awesome. High energy, blah, blah, blah. But there really is nothing that compares to someone delivering an aria unamplified with an orchestra, giving all the different tones and textures that it can provide versus less the less amount of instruments in like a band or something like that yeah and just the incredible amount of collaboration that it takes to put on an opera you know you have up to 100 people in the pit you have 100 chorus singers plus lead singers and you got stage hands and costumers i mean just everything that goes into it it's just astounding that it can come together and be so coherent yeah and that's why it's i always encourage people to go into the arts, especially if they're younger, whether or not they want to be a performer, just because, well, it's a ton of fun. And there's so many things that you can do uh, that are that are not just performing that <clears throat> that you can be an asset. So yeah, it's it's an amazing thing to not only experience as an audience member, but also as a performer or stagehand or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that wraps up our first episode of talking about making opera relevant and um you know i have a, a few fun links that i'll list on um our patreon page if you want to check that out um i'll right. list this uh opera wire did a quiz about can you recognize this opera from the modern production so it has video or pictures and it wants you to guess which opera it was and i'll tell you i took it and i did terrible <laughs> got like two of them right oh man it's tricky it really is <laughs> and then um a couple articles that i thought were uh, pretty good reads opera pulse did an editorial on making opera relevant in the current economy and that was done in two 2014 so it's a little old but still relevant and um then there was another one from uh, I should have wrote down the organization, roh.org, a UK group, and they had, how can you be relevant in today's time, time, poor world? So I, they're also talking about the money involved and reaching out to audiences um, that aren't just made of rich people. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, as, as always, we would love to hear any comments or uh, take up any questions you have or topics that you want us to cover um, or that we may have missed, uh, you know, so we can bring those, of course, onto the podcast um, and address those uh, things for all of you.
So, and hopefully I won't sound like I'm still going through puberty at 36 the next time uh, <laughs> we, we do this podcast. Because, uh, yeah, it's been a joy trying to navigate this. <laughs> you, you didn't have your cough drops? <clears throat> Oh, I had some. Your hot, your hot tea. I even went and ran today, like hoping that would get some of this out of me. But, you know. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. For more information about Opera Unbound, please feel free to visit us at patreon.com slash Opera Unbound. And also on Instagram at Opera Unbound. <laughs>